My fellow Americans, the day has finally come, and it's time to fight for our lives. Let's get suited up. Gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Why is modern armor so tiny? To many people who are new to armor, the standard size seems wildly ineffective because it only covers a small part of the human body. So today we're gonna to look at that. We're gonna look at the history of armor with particular regards to sizing. We're gonna look at modern shapes and cuts. And finally, we're gonna talk about ways to enhance your armor coverage. All this and more on the Armored Republic TV show. Really quick, I wanna to talk to you about the sponsor of the channel. Today's sponsor is the Invictus Gen 2 Large Plate Carrier, an enigmatic plate carrier that is both sleek and yet ginormous. For a ninja-sized Goliath, you might think, it is laser cut, very low profile, and yet only capable of holding 11 by 14 plates. Why this was ever commissioned is a mystery to mankind, and yet it is supporting this channel every single day. So thank you very much, Invictus Gen 2 Large. Since the invention of firearms, we found that bullets have generally outpaced the power of body armor such that body armor was not very practical to use. In the very earliest cases of firearms in the 16th century, we see that sometimes people could use slightly thicker versions of the armor used against crossbow bolts and arrows, and that was sufficient to stop the rounds coming at them. But then, with the development of even better firearms in the next century, in the 17th century, Generally, people didn't use body armor that much because in order to stop the bullets, you would have to have extremely cumbersome plates. And so, people essentially dropped the idea. And that's basically the story of body armor from the 1600s to the 1800s, is one of a lack of use. There are some exceptions though, for example, the bandit Ned Kelly from Australia did use a 97 pound steel suit, actually made of iron and handmade, so as to face off the police in his final bout. However, as you could guess, this was a very cumbersome piece of kit, and he was also unable to deal with the wounds he received in his hands and other places that he could not cover. So the steel armor that he created was not widely proliferated. It was too heavy. And then in the 20th century, there was an increase in the interest of personal body armor because of how much static defense was occurring in World War I. Thus, you had the proliferation of steel helmets, primarily for defense against shrapnel. You did have, during World War I, the United States Army developing the Brewster Body Shield, which was very similar to knight's armor of old, but thicker, made of steel so as to defend against bullets. But once again, it was not widely adopted because it was too cumbersome. Then in World War II, skip ahead a few decades, what you see is people using flak vests where they had steel plates sewn into the vest so as to, again, protect from shrapnel and potentially from certain small arms. And that was basically the entirety of body armor until the development of soft armor in the 1970s by DuPont, which allowed for the creation of a whole new world of high coverage, lightweight technology. And that proliferated again in the 1990s when you had polyethylene armor, which allowed for composite plates to be created that could stop more bullets and were lighter. And then that leads into the modern day where we have steel plates, ceramic plates, and polyethylene plates, as well as soft armor to support the bunch that all could stop different levels at different weights and generally speaking are limited to very small areas of the human body so as to allow for maximum mobility while still protecting your vitals like your heart and your lungs. So here's the two things we learn from the history of body armor. One is that engineers throughout history generally have made overbuilt body armor with extremely high coverage and extremely high protection that once it's given over to people actually on the battlefield is rejected because it's too heavy in favor of something that's lighter and just covers the essentials like the head or the heart and lungs. The second thing we learn is that steel armor has a rich history of saving people's lives. In the modern era, we understand that rifle rated armor is too cumbersome to wear all over the body. So instead we prioritize a box in the upper half of the torso, that is covering the heart and the lungs. And the reason we do so is because for most of the body, if you get shot, all that means is that you are bleeding. 
And you might need to deal with some things in the long term, but in the short term, you can just either use a tourniquet to strap it off, or you can use wound packing gauze or a chest seal and you can keep going. Now, if you get shot in your lungs or in your heart, then it's a much bigger problem. You can't just keep going. So you protect those things so as to maximize combat effectiveness. For most people, if you want to cover your heart and lungs, then you'll fit in one of the three main sizes that you see in the armor industry, 8x10, 10x12, and 11x14. We think of these as small, medium, and large, of course, but it's important to remember that these are not correspondence to t-shirt sizes. If you wear a large t-shirt, you do not need a large plate. You're probably going to want a 10 by 12 or a medium plate. The reason why is because heart and lungs do not vary in size as much as your overall torso size. So a lot of people, when they enter the armor world, overestimate how big a plate they need, and then they get stuck with problems because they don't have as much mobility as is ideal when you're looking at a modern armor system. So 90% of people could use a 10 by 12 or a medium size plate. If you are very small, say five foot four or under, then a small plate or an eight by 10 could work well for you. And then if you are very large, say six foot four or over, then an 11 by 14 may work very well for you. But that's only really if you're broad shouldered, not if you're just really tall. Now, really quick, I'll also note that the military does not use this exact sizing system. Rather, they use what they call the SAPI system, but it's basically the same. Instead of the small, medium, large I just gave, they have small, medium, large, and extra large. Their small is a little bit bigger than 8x10. Their medium and large both are basically 10x12, and then their extra large is actually exactly 11x14. So they essentially just have the small, medium, large with a little bit more customization, you could say, around the middle. It's really not necessary to worry about that as long as your plate carrier fits the plates that you have. Let's talk a bit about the benefits of a properly sized plate because a lot of people, as I mentioned before, really want to get that higher coverage, even though in the long run, it actually is detrimental to them. Now, there's two reasons that you probably want a 10 by 12, or you at least don't want a plate that's too big for you. One is dexterity of your torso, and two is dexterity of your arms. Talking about the torso, if you have a plate that extends below your rib cage, whenever you bend over, it's going to stab you in the stomach, which is very uncomfortable and demotivates you from getting in positions that otherwise are tactically effective and helpful to you. The second thing is also, it's gonna weigh down your torso a lot in terms of the added weight, which when you're carrying your plates for a long time is a big detriment. Talking about the arms, when you're looking at what your arms need to do, they need to be able to move across your torso and they need to move and shoulder your rifle effectively, which is something that is difficult to do when you've got plates that are too large. In the next section, we'll discuss plate cuts a bit, which is also a factor to consider. But if your plates are overall too large because you've got an 11 by 14, but you're five foot nine, then this is gonna be a big problem for you. So get a 10 by 12 plate, the vast majority of you. You need a 10 by 12 plate and it's gonna make your life exorbitantly better. Now let's talk briefly about plate cuts, which is admittedly a more nuanced discussion because the difference is quite slight. There's two main cuts that people discuss, sappy and shooters. Sappy cut is also known as the standard cut and it's used by the United States military, which is a little confusing because sappy is also a sizing system and it is a curve. But it's also a cut that is basically defined as a rectangle with little triangles cut near the top. Essentially, it's intended to maximize coverage in the box that we discussed before. Now, shooter's cut, alternatively called swimmer's cut, takes the triangles at the top and extends them down the sides, extending to basically the halfway point of the plate. Now, this is done in order to make it so that you can more easily move your arms and shoulder your rifle. The question is, is this preferable to the sappy cut? This really depends on really small differences in preference. And so a lot of people will run sappy plates and they don't mind shouldering the rifle with them. Whereas other people say that the shooter's cut is quite useful. Personally, I do like the shooter's cut quite a lot, but I'm happy using either plate. Quick note, some people will say that swimmer's cut is actually a different cut entirely from shooters, but variants on this are not very common. Most people use shooters anyways, so it's not really worth delving into. If this video gets a million likes, we will do a full breakdown on the history of swimmer's cut plates. Until then, let's move on. So we've discussed modern sizes and shapes. Now let's talk about ways to enhance your armor coverage. The first one is side armor. 
side hard armor to be specific. These plates normally in six by six or six by eight that sit inside your cummerbund and allow you to have greater protection, mostly in the front. It's important that you place these not really at a 90 degree angle, but more angled forward because 70% of shots or so are taken in the front as opposed to in the back. Now, side plates are particularly useful for CQB and vehicle operations because you're getting a lot more coverage for not a lot of sacrificed movements because you're in tight spaces in those circumstances. So for those situations, side plates can be really, really valuable. For some people, they say side plates are a must, but then on the other hand, again, some people think that armor itself is not a must, so that's something that you can decide. I will say that side plates are actually surprisingly lightweight. The six by six, especially in the A2 form, does not add a ton of weight. It might add a little bit of a cumbersome nature with your cummerbund, but overall, they're very nice. Now let's talk about another enhancement, which, maybe gives you some best of both worlds coverage. And that is this. This is actually a cummerbund soft armor panel that goes around the side, wrapping around your entire body. Now, this is particularly useful because of how it's really lightweight. It actually adds some structure to your cummerbund, which can help it bear the load of your entire load bearing system. And also, obviously, it provides armor coverage. It is not rifle rated, of course, because it is soft armor. However, it does provide protection against handgun rounds and against shrapnel, which a lot of people are more concerned about, especially with the proliferation of drones, exploding drones, explosives that you want soft armor protection from. Now let's talk about just this pouch, which is actually a dangler intended to go beneath your carrier and protect you further. You can put a soft armor insert inside something like this. The military issues a lot of these and they're actually quite a lot of coverage. But then at the same time, when I was wearing one of these, my friends said that they got an aneurysm whenever they saw it. So it might not be the most appealing to some of you. Now let's talk about the final coverage option, the most epic of them all, which is the shield. The shield is, as you can see, a ton of coverage, and that's for two reasons. One, because it's physically bigger than your plate carrier or armor, and secondly, because when you put it in front of you, it's covering more of your body. That allows you to have just a ton of coverage, which can be really useful in CQB operations, particularly when you're thinking of something like home defense, where you need to make sure that you can grab something quickly. You might not want to spend the time of putting on an entire carrier. A shield can be right there next to your rifle or handgun or shotgun, and there it is, ready to go. Ton of coverage, and you can get them in handgun or rifle rated variants. Some people will say, ah, this shield is very heavy, but in many circumstances, you don't need to carry the shield for a very long time. Or if you get tired, you can also protect a position having it rested on the ground, which again, protects a very large portion of your body, especially in comparison to a plate carrier with armor inside. This particular shield has been shot with 44, and as you can see on the back, it has zero penetrations, even though it was shot multiple times in close proximity to each other. So this is a very reliable form of protection. This one particularly is handgun rated, but then we have rifle rated versions as well. The handgun rated one, you would opt for that oftentimes because one, most criminals are using handguns and not rifles, and two, it is much, much lighter. An added benefit of using a shield in comparison to armor is the back face deformation. If you look at these little dimples here, you might feel that if you were wearing an armor plate, though probably not if it were rifle rated. But when it comes to a shield, that's not likely to hurt you at all. And in fact, tests where people have simulated arms holding the shields find that unless you get a penetration or you're shooting hundreds of rounds, you're not likely to get any damage to your arm. Well, there you have it. Why is modern armor so tiny? Well, it's so small because in order to protect against the rifle rounds that we face today, it needs to be rather stout, which means that you can't have it protecting your entire body. History has tried it, and people out on the field have rejected it. And so this is what people on the field say is necessary in order to protect against the threats that matter most. I'm Logan Reese with Armored Republic, and in a republic, there is no king but Christ.